Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am Krista Burns, your host here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover any sort of activities or anything that may be of interest to Nebraska librarians. We have Commission staff that do some presentations and we have guest speakers as we do this morning. We do these sessions every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time and they are recorded so if you are unable to attend one of our live sessions you can watch one of our many archived sessions we've gone on two years now of doing Encompass Live and we have them all listed on our website so you can go there and watch anything that we've done um, on a previous session. This morning we have a couple of librarians, I, I believe both of you are there, Gail? We are. We <laughs> From are. Um, Blair Public Library, uh, Gail Roberts. Gail Roberts and Wendy Lukert, who are going to talk about special collections at libraries. Um, this is a presentation you guys did at our NLA NEMA conference last fall, I believe. We did. So um, we've uh, got them on hand here to uh, reenact that, I suppose, <laughs> and possibly do um, talk about anything new. Um, what I'm going to do then is hand over presentation capabilities to you guys, and you will then be sh able to show your screen to the group. Okay, so now I can bring up my PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. You should have gotten a pop-up saying you to make you a presenter with a pull-down menu to choose. Show my screen. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. There it is. Yep, we're seeing it. We're seeing your yeah. second slide. Yeah, go ahead and start the slide. If you do that, yep, do that, and we'll see it from, yep, there you go. We are okay. seeing what you're seeing. All good. <laughs> awesome. Well, how many people did we have here today? Um, there are, well, let's see, nine people, nine locations logged in, but I knew though, I do know that at least two of them have multiple people sitting in. Awesome. Well, so, um, I, I can't yeah. see who you are, but I welcome you and I'm glad you're here and please ask lots of questions, jump in. I'm, you know, if I'm doing it in, in person, I chat a lot with the audience and I, I like that. So, um, please do. Mm -hmm. We. This is one of those um, things and one of those presentations where really it's about what you can do for your community. Um, and like our title says, collections for your community. Uh, one of the things I love about this PowerPoint is that I love this whole setup with the vision because I think collections are very visionary and I think they're, they explain and, and work with your community and help them become who they need and who they want to be. So thinking outside the box about collections for your library is kind of what we're going to talk about. And, um, you know, kind of like put your little librarian hat aside and put your fun hat on and let's see what we can come up with. Um, collective thoughts. Well, gosh, I'm going to, can I minimize you here? There we go. We'll move you a little. Um, books and library resources should be provided for the interest information and enlightenment of all people of the community the library serves. I think that's highly important and of course it's what we struggle for. We are always going to have our monographs, we are always going to have our serials. Those things are part of our core collection, they are part of what we really do and you know we, have, we hopefully know what to do with our readers advisory, we have all this good stuff, but there's those traditional sources and then there's non-traditional. Some of the non-traditional items could include your DVDs, your CDs, um, video games, items that are not the traditional books and periodicals. And you probably are thinking, well, you know, I had a hard time with that when I when I when we got ready to do this because I just assumed that music CDs and audiobooks were traditional collections. But in the uh, library research that we did, and in the literature reviews, those were considered non-traditional. So if you have those, you're at least on your track. Huh, they're so common nowadays, you would assume they would have switched over to the traditional side. You're right. I know. Hmm. I mean, I just, really, I just was like amazed. I was like, what? No way. <laughs> I was like, well, here we were ahead and we didn't even know it. So there's, um, oh, I guess before my map, I should go back. We did uh, a lot of research. and. It was amazing the kinds of things that you found out there that people did, and here I was, you know, thinking my little ideas were, were kind of strange, but hold on to your hats. Um, in America, Wendy did all kinds of research and, as well, and we found that there are libraries that have tool libraries. 
that includes everything from screwdrivers and hammers to major power tools like jackhammers, items like that, snowblowers, all kinds of the big stuff as well as, you know, wrenches. And some of the places that have those is Gross Point, Michigan, Oakland, California, and Berkeley, California. Now, I thought that was interesting that those tool libraries showed up on the West Coast. I'm not sure why, but I think it's because of the mudslides. I'm not sure. They must do a lot of home uh, repair. Yeah, you know, that could be. Possible. Mm -hmm. possible. Possible. There were le electronic libraries. Um, GPSs. Seattle, Washington is one of the libraries that offers GPSs for their patrons to check out and use. Um, other electronics that this could include are if you have handheld video games or portable CD players, MP3 players, items like that. And I don't know about um, a lot of you, but we do at Blair have portable CD players that we check out to people. We have, you know, um, a lot of different equipment like projection screens, things of that sort, overhead projectors. Uh, still, we still have the um, what do you film strip viewers and uh, the slide projectors and things like that? Because not everyone has gotten rid of that old technology yet. And so we do have that. Fishing rods. Who, who would think fishing rods would be exciting? I would not have guessed in a million years that anyone would have a fishing rod collection. But in Danville Public, New York, they do. And the way they work their fishing rod library is their patrons can check out the items for a day and go to some of the local lakes and different things and go fishing without having to buy all the items that they need. I thought that was kind of cool. So there's lots of different things out there besides just your typical, you know, books and cereals and what you're going to do. So how do you get going if you want to have a different collection? Well, first you probably have to come up with the idea of what you want. And we do have a specific example later with one that uh, we followed through with. But just to kind of get you thinking, um, you need to identify the need. What is it that you want to offer? Who is it going to, you know, do your five W's, just like you do from the time you were like five years old. So who is it going to be for? What need is it going to address? You know, what is it going to be? When are we going to offer it? Where are we going to store it? Where are we going to keep it? Where are we going to, you know, collect it? What are we going to do? And why are we doing it? Is it really important? Is it something that will really, 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 really make a difference to our people? Or is it something we just think will be fun? Sometimes that's enough, you know. If it's something you think will be fun and it works, then great. And if it's not, then it's, you know, you might want to reevaluate. But you always want to come up with your plan, your basic plan. Um, and then you want to brainstorm. With your brainstorm, you want to talk with your staff. You want to get their ideas of how they foresee the program working. You want to get ideas if they have a collection idea. You also want to talk to your community. You want to find out some items that your community wishes that they could check out at the library. If they can't afford to buy a particular thing. It would be really nice if the library could do something. It's a great way to get some ideas. You know, I in looking at what we have found online and, and across the country in literature reviews, it doesn't seem that there's a limit as to the size of your library. I thought when I first got into this whole idea that it was going to be more of a rural thing. But really it's not. Uh, larger libraries do the exact same thing and actually they have more space a lot of times to hold items than the smaller libraries do. But I do think it is important to talk with your staff, your community, your parents. Um, with our project we particularly spent a lot of time with the community and parents because that was such an essential part of the buy-in to get it to work. Check out your facts. Do a literature review. I'm sure you've had people lecture you on that. Um, I always have. I know in school that's all I did. Literature review, literature review. And, but it helps. You know, it's always good to stay abreast of what's out there and what's going on. Now you'll find with some of your special collection needs that you're not going to find much out there. I haven't done one in the last six months on it, but the only ones I found in the last three years had to do with the state of Ohio. Ohio is pretty progressive, and they have a lot of interesting stuff in their, their state. And they had a very large toy library that 
grew from one branch to many branches and they did a wonderful job of documenting it and, and putting it in print. Which kind of leads me to, to prompt you that if you do a lot of special collection stuff, you know, write an article. Get it out there for us because I think it's important for people to see that it does work and it is an, an, an adventure. One of the things that the literature reviews will help you with though is the, the planning process because like when I was doing my toy library, we, I, I borrowed from Ohio a lot because they had how to clean, how to do, how to do this, what their timeline was. So that really helps me not have to recreate and reinvent the wheel. Talk to people who have actually done it. Um, when you do your literature review... Um, hey, Gail, can I interrupt just a second? Um, if Wendy can get a little closer to the microphone, it's a little harder to hear her than you. I'm not sure what kind of setup right. you guys have there. We'll pull, we'll pull that over. Try to, yeah. Is that better? Okay. Yes, right. much louder. Yep. Good. Cool. With Thanks. the personal Go ahead. experiences, you want to talk to other libraries that have done it, find out how they worked it. Find out, you know, if they had problems, what they discovered that they hadn't expected would happen. It's a really good way, and most librarians will gladly share information with you if you just ask. And of course, the ever popular websites. You know, you do a web search, you get out there and Google it, and it's going to come up. It's amazing what you found, isn't it, Wendy? Oh, it was very interesting. It's not always the easiest to find. When you type in non-traditional collections, you can come up with some interesting things. So be prepared. <laughs> the next step that we went with, and that I do believe is, is next, is to form your committee. Now, if you are a smaller library, you are going to probably have yourself and a staff member or your library board president or you know somebody from the community, but somebody in the community that will help you, you know, kind of get things going and organized. So you want to build your case. You want to sit down with your committee and you want to talk about it. You want to build the idea. You want to know what you're doing. Why are you doing it? Do your five W's. I mean, you're kind of repeating some of your steps, but you're doing it with your committee, and that starts building that community feeling and it gets them all to buy into the whole idea. So kind of work it up and get it going. Then you want to approach your library board or the city or governing body of your library and the community. You, most cases you need to get approval from the library board or the governing body to go ahead and add the collection. You also want their support. You want them to help promote what you are trying to do. They're going to be essential in creating the circulation policies and the, you know, fine policies and things like that. So the, and the more you've built your case and you've gotten your proposal typed up and you're, you're looking very organized, as you approach that governing body, it's going to be much simpler and they're going to approve it and say, wow, that's kind of a cool idea. Or they might look at you funny and say, well, okay, but let's see how it works. But still, they know that you've got a plan and you're doing a good job. Our first attempt um, took place three years ago when I was the children's librarian. And um, it was my first grant project ever. And it, it came about funny, uh, kind of in a funny way. But it, it, it turned out to be a great thing. And I believe that uh, collaborations are just essential to pull off good projects. And we had a huge collaborative effort on this between the local college, Dana College, which unfortunately is no longer here, the community schools and the library. And what we did is we opened an educational resource center, which is also known as our toy library. Um, our timeline started in February of 08 through July 08. That was the beginning process. That's when we sat down, we formed our committee, we set our timeline, we made our plan. We talked about it, and, and actually how it all came about was I had started in December of, um, of seven, I guess. Jeez, gosh, I've been here a long time already. And um, we sat down with parents as I was talking to them, and they were all needing mentoring and, and uh, tutoring help for their kids, not just in reading, but in math and spelling. I mean, they were having some issues, and the school system didn't have any tutoring available. So I went to a meeting that um, had a lot of uh, movers and shakers, and it was our LiveWise 40 meeting, which if you um, have a LiveWise group you can connect with, I would encourage it. You can get a lot done. Um, 
we have a very active group, thankfully. And so I was at that meeting, and, and this lady next to me said, who are you? And I said, well, my name's Gail. I'm the children's librarian at the, at the library. And she said, oh, I need to talk to you. And I said, well, who are you? <laughs> and she gave me her name, and she was the service learning coordinator at Nana College. Uh, another huge, huge plus, work with your local colleges, uh, whether it's your community college or a, a university, whatever it could be, even if it's, you know, you're not exactly close to them, but you're close enough, their service learning projects are wonderful, and, and those are, you know, they're willing to help with so many things. So she told me she wanted a toy library, and I said, well, I want an educational center because I have people who need tutoring, and so she's like, Match made in heaven. Within two weeks, she had our committee pulled together. She, you know, um, we sat down and we had, had drafted out our five W's. We had gone through the whole shebang, and we were ready to start taking it to the people. We started writing our grants. Um, I did the grant writing starting in July. We had a we have a community foundation grant. I write. I, I got money from, and plus I got uh, our youth and excellence grant, and those two. Uh, were essential for the majority of it. In July, we held a Christmas in July party, so we had Santa come in his Hawaiian outfit, and you know we raised some money that way. The lo a local photographer came and took pictures, and the proceeds of that went to the toy library. So we got a lot of community again buy-in by bringing them to this fundraising part of it, and the grants, of course, helped tremendously. Then there were the committee assignments. This started in September of 2008 to December of 2008. Um, the different members of the committee had different items that they were in charge of putting together. It included who getting ideas on how to store the library or the materials for the toy library, how it was going to be checked out, all of that different stuff, how the items were going to be purchased, where they were going to be purchased from. And the other part of it that, again, was a huge um, show to our community that everyone was involved. The college, the um, child psychology department and the early education department, uh, the, er the uh, early ed teachers, those programs are the ones who put the toy lists together and evaluated them to make sure that they were going to um, address ages, all ages and all levels. So we took that then to the school, had them kind of go through to the school system, and they kind of approved and worked on that as well. So everybody was kind of pulling together on it, and it made it a much easier transition once it was open. There was also several staff meetings held to discuss the workflow, and this took place from December of 08 to January of 09. During those staff meetings, they discussed also who was going to be in charge of getting the toys ready for circulation, how they were going to be circulated, how they were going to be counted and cleaned when they came back in, all that different. And it, you know, it wasn't a one-time thing. It was like every week we came back with more ideas because once you start thinking, you know, you're going to keep thinking. And so we just set this whole two months, you know time frame that we could, you know, do it and we could role play it and see if it was going to work. And if it wasn't, then, you know, the heck with it, let's scratch it and do it again. So it was kind of a process, but it, again, it gave a buy-in for the whole group and not just a one-person show. And, and that's I, always good to know that things aren't always going to work exactly right and it's okay to change things as you as things you realize, oh, that was a bad idea, let's try this instead. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I, like, threw everything in the waste can. I was like, oh, I don't like that. You know, so it was it was a necessary <laughs> thing. So you want to give yourself enough time, you know, so that you're not pressuring yourself because I think if you pressure yourself, then it's you're gonna have more errors. You're not gonna be as comfortable with it. You know, so give yourself plenty of time to to work out those little odds and ends that you need to do. And does anyone have any questions or anything? Because like I, I can talk forever. So you know it's always good to interrupt if you have something. I don't know if I can see if you have any questions. But. Um, no, but I'm monitor monitoring it on the questions okay. section. Um, nothing yet. Okay. But like, like right. we said, if you do have any questions, feel free on, along the oh, way. Yeah, type them in there, and we'll, we'll ask them. Because I know I can, like I said, I ramble. So. <laughs> um, it's, uh, but, yeah, I really, really stress that because I, 
you know, part of making, I think, a project work well is to really be comfortable with all facets of it. And by having your workflow down and your, your idea of how it's going to work, um, even when it starts, you're probably going to change it. But still. So the toys started coming. It was so fun. It was like Christmas. And they started coming in January 09. And uh, I loved it. We had a student that Dana assigned to us through their work-study program, and which was awesome. And she came down and she spent actually almost a year and a half with us cataloging toys and getting our system up and going. And she was wonderful. But um, it was fun. It was just a great time. And during this time, did you have some toy testers? To we about? did. We had uh, members of the community that we had talked to about the project and had come to the fundraisers and whatever and had small children. I had them take the toys home and test them and bring them back. And that got the kids really excited about the whole thing. They were like, is there more toys? Are there more toys? And they would come running into the back room with us, you know, to see what was new and what came. And um, that was fun. And again, community buy-in, you know, spreads the word. It's, it's a great those, idea. Those kids are your community, absolutely. <laughs> oh, they are. And, you know, it's so fun because they would come back and one, one little girl particularly would be like, Miss Gail, this wasn't much fun. And I'd look at it and I'd say, well, that's because it's for an older kid, I think. You know? And she'd uh, say, well, I like the monkey one. You know? so they all had their favorites <laughs> like, right away. Uh -huh. and, but that did help us because even though the catalogs say it's for a certain age level or whatever, it really helped us see how those age levels worked with it. And um, it was just kind of an essential part for us, and it was really nice. It also got the parents in, and then they sat down and helped count the pieces and everything for us. So that kind of took some of our time, you know, freed up some of our time. It was very helpful, and the kids just had a blast with it. The first toys were checked out April 09. Now, we were, you know, a little, when I started this, my director was very, you know, well, hopefully we could get 25 checkouts a month. That would be great. <laughs> I'm thinking, I just spent $5,000. I hope it's going to be more than 25. But I was like, yeah, you know, we'll start small. And we checked them out, and it was just fun. Again, it was so much fun for the kids to just, they were just like, you can come to the library and get a toy? I'm like, oh, I know, and be careful. You might learn something with it, you know. So we... We think it went very successfully. Now that first that first month, we had 68 checkouts. That told me there really was some interest, um, way more than probably we thought there would be. In that time frame, in that first month or first two months, I had one lady walk in, absolutely burst into tears. She was, um, you know, exceptionally grateful. She, you know, I thought maybe something was wrong, and I was like, oh, what's wrong, you know, and, and but she was like, I could never have afforded this. This is going to make a huge difference in our lives, and they became advocates. They were here every week checking out because we made our, our toys one-week checkouts with a renewal of one week because some of them, some of them are set up for larger classrooms where they can work on phonics and, and all kinds of things, so, you know, a two-week period is not unusual. Um, I, I mean, I've had kids come in that first, you know, six months where they were just like, God, Miss Gail, do you know that two plus two is four? And I'd be like, yes, where did you learn that? You know, and they're like, this game. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it was making a awesome. difference. And, and it was, you know, I mean, it used to be that the kids ran straight to the DVDs, but now they ran straight to the toy library box, you know, because what we do... Um, it's hard. We didn't have a, a way to show it. But we use those video browser windows that you can order from different office supply places. And we put our, like our DVDs, we put the sleeve in there, and then our DVDs are behind the desk, and they bring us the sleeve. We check out the movies. Same with the toys. We put the video, or the graphic picture of it. The back of the, the, back of the browser window talks about what age it is, what, or what age, what age it is, what age it's meant to serve, the skills that it's working on. Um, you know, we came up with a standard list of skills of um, 
subject headings and all those things so they we knew they were working on hand-eye coordination or working on creative learning or work, working on math skills, all those kinds of things. So all of that's listed on the back, how you can use the toy to its best advantage, and how many pieces are included, because if they don't bring them back, they're going to they're gonna pay me for it. And um, we'll pay the library, not me. But um, so it, you know, it gives you a lot of information right there. And the, the kids now really, I mean, parents can check out four DVDs and four toys, and the first thing they bring me are the toys. <laughs> so I think that's pretty, pretty exceptional. That first summer, we had 519 checkouts. We thought that was pretty amazing. And we now average 148 checkouts a month, and summer checkouts are over 300 a month. Uh, we do include it. We include our toy library in our, in our summer reading program because it does focus a lot on math and spelling and music and geography. So there's, they're not, you know, hopefully they're keeping skills for the summer, you know, as much as, as the reading skills. Um, I know the teachers have been very excited that we do that and push those other skills as well and not just reading during our summer program. So that's kind of what, how our project went. It, um, I think it's a continual thing. We now budget part of our budget for um, new toys every year. We have the foundation support. They have seen what what has happened. They've we've had people write to the paper about how much they've loved it. So the foundation is there. Like, do you need money for toys? You know, <laughs> we have money. So you know, there's a lot lot more there. You know, a lot more support than even when we started. It's great when they offer you the money and you didn't even have to ask. <laughs> I know, I know. We're, we're pretty happy with our foundation. They've just funded our new teen area, too. They bought all our new furniture and our new rug, and so we're, we, we like our foundation. So now what's next? Oh, yeah, because, you know, once you get it to work once, um, good heavens, the sky's the limit. So um, oh, I went the wrong way. Sorry. The puzzles. In November, we started a puzzle swap, and how that works is we had some puzzles donated to us that we put out on the shelf. Patrons are allowed on their honor system to just go pick out a puzzle, take it home with them. We don't check them out. We just ask that if they find that there's pieces missing, that they just dispose of the puzzle, don't even bring it back. We've had several patrons donate puzzles that they've had sitting in their closets and don't do anymore because they're bored with them. So they bring them here and then take some new ones home to work on. Um, in fact, last night I just took a couple puzzles home from our puzzle swap for my girls to do today since there's no school today. Yep, we, we did the same. And that has been, I mean, our older patrons have loved that. They have been, you know, like coming in and one of them found a Springbok puzzle. I didn't know there was such an excitement to Springbok puzzles, but apparently there is. And she was just like, oh my gosh, I have a you know, I haven't spent money on one of those in years. So she took it home, and she's all excited. And again, so that makes it something that we can serve our, our public with, and they have a great time with it. It's fun. That one's cheap. It's easy. And it took very little space. I apparently am PowerPoint challenge today. Another type of collection we're we've been talking about and we're starting to approach some of our community members like the teachers, our teacher resources. We're trying to get ideas of some items that the teachers could use in their classrooms more towards the effect of flannel board items, file folder games, whiteboard games, items that they can use in their classroom to help them be more successful with their children. Last, uh, at the end of last summer, we held a teacher open house to start uh, approaching the teachers about this project. They seemed very excited. They came in and had lunch and breakfast with us and stuff like that. And um, we had some books for them. But more, it opened again that conversation between the public library and the schools, which has been one of our goals and one of the goals of the school to work closer with us. So we're very excited about that. Um, I'm thinking probably that will be part of our, our you know foundation wish list or something for some money to work on that. Our schools had gone to whiteboards, so they, you know, again, at $32 to $39 a pop for those things, if we can have them and circulate them to many people versus the one. And I think the other plus about the teacher resources is 
our homeschool population will be able to access this quality information and teaching plans. And we have a fairly good sized homeschool population, which is a huge uh, user of our toy library. And I'm very excited about offering this kind of material for them. Exactly. Cake pans. We all have cake. Does everybody have cake pans? I can't hear, but that I is a it. very common one. Yes, um, it is. It is. We do not have room for cake pans. We'd love to have cake pans. I have one on my shelf. I have a patron who just really wants us to do this, so she brought her cake pans anyway. But what we did do is we started a cookie cutter collection after an LA. Oh was back, yes. And we've got about. 50 to 60 catalogs so far. We have more to catalog. And we haven't really presented it to the public yet, but we've already had checkouts. In fact, over the weekend, we had somebody come in because they saw in the card catalog that we had a football cookie cutter, and they're getting ready for the Super Bowl. And she was all excited because we have cookie cutters. So it, again, it was just kind of a, would our people really use this? And had you gone to our NLA uh, presentation, everybody got a cookie cutter to start their cookie cutter collection if they wanted to. And so we came back and we thought, well, we should put all of these in a collection and <laughs> do it. And my gosh, if people haven't checked it out, it just amazes me. Christmas, we had several checked out. We had several checked out. So, you know, I'm sure it will grow. Another type of collection is home decor. And I know there are some libraries in the area that do offer um, framed pictures and framed artwork to check out. Um, we do not have the space to store that right now, but we did kind of take the home decor idea and do a Christmas decoration swap where we set up a table and had patrons bring in Christmas decorations that they were tired of and didn't want to put out, and they could take new decorations that were on the table, and it just gave a way to trade items. We had people coming in every day to see if there was anything new. Um, we had some moms come in and their daughter had just moved in with their new husband and they didn't have anything and they wiped this out one day and, you know, I mean, I get it. It was a very fun thing, an easy thing to do for our people and it made, it made us that community place again and we just can't beat that. Websites that we have found and, and we'll talk about the second one a lot. Um, I think the first one was just cake pans, wasn't it, Andy? Yeah. It was a library talking about how their cake pan collection is growing and how they've taken care of it, different things like that. The next one is one that I found really interesting, and I'm still trying to get Gail convinced that we need to do it. Um, it's about a library that does a seed library in the spring where they have patrons bring in half-to-use seed packets that they don't have enough room in their garden. And they, you can do, basically it's another trade where you can get seeds that you don't have and you can bring in your extra seeds and just trade back and forth. I like it because it's seasonal, so it's not going to take up a lot of space for very much time. And it's a good way, rather than just having seeds laying around, to recycle and help with that. I think um, when we did our presentation, there were a few libraries in Nebraska that were already doing this. And one, I can't remember if it was South Sioux or if it was the Winnebago Reservation. So if you're out there and I'm messing you up and not presenting this right, I apologize. Um, but one of you did it, not only did they do the, the seed trade-off, but then at harvest time, they all brought their food into the library and patrons could take the food, which I thought was very cool. And so it kind of did a community gardening project almost, and I think that was pretty awesome. Um, and I think that I am sold on. I, it's, again, a matter of us figuring out space and, and how we're going to, I know it won't take it a lot, but just, you know, timing because you're going into summer reading. So we have to, you know, kind of really look at it and see how we're going to, you know, supplement it and get it going as well as, as you know, keep it, keep it off and, and to see whether or not we want to do a harvest thing. Um, but very interesting and very interesting results that Richmond has. And the final website is slideshare.net, and we found a link of a short video that talks about how to catalog the weird items. They consider weird items also as DVDs and CDs, so it talks about that, but it also talks about other items and how you don't always, you can't always catalog the unique 
collections in your normal system. You just have to kind of make it up as you go a little bit and adapt things to work for your library system. And of course, we all know that if we do that, we just have to make sure that we stay consistent with what we are creating so that it's in there, findable, searchable, and you know our, our people can find it. But that 3D stuff, you know that is kind of weird and kind of fun. And I don't know how the new cataloging standards will affect us. We'll have to keep our eye on that a little bit and, and see if Ooh, that maybe works. Maybe they've, encount they've accounted for that since they're new standards and this is something lots of libraries have been doing. Yeah. I don't know. Be. I'm not a cataloger, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> well, I'm not really either. <laughs> But, you know, every time they mention that new stuff, I'm like, oh, gosh, I'm going to have to learn something new. But mm -hmm. it'll, you know, we'll, I think, I think local still trumps. And so, you know, I think you have to make it work for you. But, so that's kind of, I, that's kind of how we go. We kind of go with the flow here. We are happy to work with anybody. If um, you like what we've done, if, for instance, you want to do a toy library, I know Wahoo is uh, doing one now. And uh, we have offered up our records and everything to them to make their life a little easier, and we're happy to do that with anybody. Um, we'd like to hear what all everybody else has tried, if they have tried anything, because it's kind of fun to get those ideas from everybody to, to see what else is out there. I know I, I'm not big on that home decor one, but... Uh, I can see where the Christmas thing just went bonkers. So well, it's like you said, you go with what your community might be talking about or asking about. Exactly. You know, maybe in those areas it was a big deal. <laughs> um, I just want to say to everyone, those links that were on the previous slide, we will include um, links to the um, to them in our delicious account when we put the recording up, so you um, didn't have to worry about scribbling all those down. We do that every time we do these sessions. Um, we do have one question that came through while you're talking. Yeah about um, how do you handle missing or broken toys? Have you well, had any problems or, with that yet with the kids? You know, amazingly, we have very, very few problems with that. Um, I would say this summer was the hardest hit we've been um, with some missing pieces. If the toy is still functional without it, I don't get too excited. Um, I ask the patron to go back and look for the piece. Usually they find it the next week or something when they're vacuuming under the couch. Um, <laughs> if it's truly broken, they know they have to pay for it. And we've really had no issue with anybody. I'm very cautious if it's a really expensive toy. We have one that's worth $289. And oh, wow. I often will hand this you know, to the parent, excuse me, I will hand it to the parent, I'll say, this does cost $289. Are you aware? <laughs> uh -huh. And I'll say, thank you. <laughs> How much said, we don't think we'll take that home. <laughs> 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 you know, so, and then I had, an, I have, um, oh, these were the most beautiful blocks. They were um, natural wood with mirrors on the inside. One set had mirrors, one set had colored water, and one set had colored beads. And you build them all together. I put them all together. Well, all together, it's a hundred dollars set of blocks. But separately, they were like thirty-nine dollars or thirty dollars or whatever. And one grandma came back and she was like, "I owe you money." And I'm like, "Well, why?" <laughs> I'm thinking, "How can she break the block?" <laughs> and, but she decided to make the blocks match the color of the water, so she colored them. And so, yeah, she paid me my thirty-nine ninety-nine. Ah, yeah. Ordered a new set of blocks. So, but that's really been about it. I mean, the one thing, too, is we make sure that every time the item is returned, we count it. Absolutely. So that we know that all the pieces are there when it goes out. So if it does come back missing a piece, we're pretty sure that the person that checked it out probably has it somewhere in their vehicle or at home, something like that. So we know that it was there before they took it. Right, you know, some right. Items We've had to take out just because of wear and tear, and I don't charge for normal wear and tear. Or and that's common with any any library, yeah. any of the materials yeah. that you're lending, of course. Yep. Exactly. And when things have gone out, like we had um, one of our first toys was a bean bog, a bean bag toss, and it was great fun. The kids loved it. Well, it wasn't built the sturdiest, so the plastic tore and tore, and we duct taped and duct taped and fixed it and fixed it, and finally I just took it out. It's like it's not going to stay together. It's done. Um, you know, I think 
the thing we've had the most trouble with, but they're the most popular, is the anatomy models. Uh, we had a model of the heart, we had a model, model of the brain, we had two skeletons, we had um, the Ooh, torso. interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we really do cover all areas. We do science, music, geography, I mean, we do everything. And those models we have to reorder now, but we were so busy during summer that I honestly did not feel comfortable that we were getting it counted correctly. Because some of those pieces, especially in the heart, you have to like peel off to count them correctly because there's so many little pieces that stick together. And that's one of the things I, I try now when I order. That was one of the things I learned was that you don't want to order anything with nine billion pieces that you can't hardly count. The, the heart, I mean, we'll order it again because it's so popular, but, you know, we really had to train everybody to, you know, I would find it on my desk every day, like, the pieces are gone. I'm like, no, they just got to peel. Here they are. There's four pieces here, you know. So you have to train your staff to know what to look for. Um, the Let's Tackle Kindergarten sets and the Let's Tackle Math, hundreds of pieces, but they're bigger pieces and they're easy to count. So I would, I would order those again in a, in a minute. But even though that has 400 pieces when it goes out, it always has 400 pieces when it comes back. If they miss a worm, they find it. It's, <laughs> they're, they're not hard to, to come back, you know, like that. So really on a whole, we've, we mm -hmm. just had very good luck. I think our patrons mm -hmm. were so impressed. Uh, the daycares use them. Home daycares use them. Uh, yeah, and I, I've no, and they want these things to last so they can keep using them. And I, I've noticed this, I've heard a lot with um, libraries who have gaming programs that they wonder, you know, what about these kids breaking the, like if you actually loan out an, a video game or even a board game, which goes along with toys too, what if, what if the kids break it or lose it or something? And they kind of police themselves, so to speak. They don't they want it do. to go broke, to get broken because, they and do. if one of, the, one of the kids starts doing something, they sh you know, beating on something, the other ones will stop them and say, no, yeah. no, no, that belongs to the library. You need to take care yeah. of that. So they kind of know, yeah. Yeah. Now, we, like I said, we only allow four items out at a time. That kind of helps too because it limits them financially. And it limits them, you know, most of our mm -hmm. stuff is between, you know, 15 and $30. Uh, we have a huge puppet library. We have bought almost all of the Folk Manus puppets. And we bought the portable puppet theater as well. So if they check out for puppets, I do let them check out the puppet theater. It's, I know it's a fifth thing, but I kind of feel like kids should have that chance to, you know, put on a puppet show if they want. Oh, sure. We do have a few questions. Questions okay, that have come in. Well, one comment. Um, Barry says that they also have cake pans and preschool toys there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then he wants to know what kind of toys do you recommend, which sounds like you've got a whole range. But um, can we look on your library website? So you, these are all cataloged in your online catalog, correct? Yes, Would there be are. an easy way for someone to just find out what kind of things are there that are toys? Or I think Like, I mean, you, you talked about how to catalog them. <laughs> I think if you search under toy library, they should all pop up. Yeah, okay. We can do that. Um, and then someone also wanted to know, oh, the same from Barry, can they return the toys in the book drop? Is that, is it can be returned just like anything else? As long as it fits. Most of them will not do that though. <laughs> yeah. Them bring it in. And, um, which is nice. I mean, we have three sizes of bags. We have the really big ones with the heavy board games and the heavy stuff in it. And the puppets are in big ones. Um, the little ones, and oh, and another thing we did was we put our book kits, our books with CDs, we put our book kits in the toy library so that they have a browser window that they can just go through and find. Our book kits have gone out probably two to three times more than they used to because they used to have to go through the rack and find a book they liked. And now it's just right there. They can thumb through it and bring it up and we go pull it for them. So it's made it a lot easier for them. Um, they really just don't put most of the toys in there because it's hard to fit them in our book drop and they know just to bring them in. And they're happy to do that because they want to check out more. Right. So referring to your limit of four items checked out, this, you, um, someone is asking, um, do you have family cards or individual cards which would allow one family to have more than one, more than four toys? How does that four per we work? Limit it is it? To, we limit it to adult cards. Our board... Um. Our board um, only allows DVDs to be checked out to adults, 
because and so we set it up the same as the DVD checkouts basically to make it easy for us and um, to not confuse our patrons too much. So the, pay, the DVDs and the toys, because of the expense factor, um, are checked out only on adult cards. They are a dollar day late fee. The toys they can renew for a second week, but the DVDs they cannot. So um, they're pretty. They are pretty good about getting it back. They don't. You know, it's funny. They'll pay me five cents for a book a day. They don't care, but they don't like paying a dollar a day. No, of course not. <laughs> and, and so, um, of course, like snow days and things like this, we never charge anyway. But we're, you know, they're just really pretty darn good about bringing them back, and we just don't have much trouble with it. I was surprised. Okay. I I was really worried we would. It seems like that with a lot of these new things that libraries are doing. There's a lot of concern about what if, what if, and people who use their libraries generally, for the most part, have respect for it and and take care of what they're using and, and will go with the rules. They, like you're saying, the people, the one woman who was so grateful, this is their resource, so they don't want to mess it up. <laughs> exactly, and I think that you know, I mean, we dog and pony showed it. You know, we went to I went to the extension agency and I did promotion and talk, you know, just like you do a book talk. I did a toy library talk. And I did it to all the daycares, the home daycares, the school system, you know, and we continually update, let them know if we've got something new. I mean, it's, you know, we put it in the paper. Um, it's, it's, a, it's turned into just as important a feature here as our books. And um, I think if we pulled it, we'd have a riot on our hands oh, yeah. at this point. Definitely. So it's been a good thing. I mean, it's, you know, that was, and that, I think the planning that, that you put into it, and again, that community buy-in was just extremely important in making it work well. Absolutely. That, that makes a huge difference, yeah. So. Been, new things are always fun. <laughs> That's a good attitude to have, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, any other questions coming in? Nothing new has come in while we've been talking. So let's see if as anybody far as else. toys to, to recommend, mm -hmm. the one I, I would go the other direction and I would not recommend. <laughs> mm. I would not recommend things that are not, you know, it is still a resource that you're spending money on. You want to make sure it's going to last. Um, I would be really watchful of... Um, cheaper version things. I mean, uh, my Walmart puppets did as well as my Folk Manus puppets, but the the backpack, you know, like we bought a, a we, do, we bought a lot of pretend and play sets, and the pretend and play sets did not do as well. And I, I'm sad about that. But I almost they don't have as it. long a life. <laughs> they don't have as long yeah. a life. I mean, the, the drill and the tool shop came back stripped after three checkouts. You know, it it just, some of that's not really meant for constant, constant use. Um, the idea is that, you know, kids get tired of toys, they get tired of things, so this gives the parent the chance to try it out before they buy it. It gives them the chance to use it without purchasing it if it's a more, you know, educational base that they can't afford. But the creative play stuff is going to get heavy use from your toddlers, and so that's, you know, I really am glad we bought the River Stones. Um, they're expensive. They were 100 bucks, But those kids climb on those constantly and have a great time, and it's great motor skills. We use them in our story times. We do all kinds of things. But the, the, play, the play sets just didn't hold up as well. I think we're down to two out of five. I think so. And those probably will get pulled soon because yeah. they're just not as, you know, we'd like to have dress-up clothes and stuff. but Oh, gosh, yeah. To, because you have but. to clean everything when it comes back for sanitary mm. purposes. That's going to be a lot harder to do. Yeah. And so I have avoided that. You know, I, we've had requests, but I'm just not so sure we can physically manipulate it better. So you have to really look at those kinds of things. Okay, I'm going to um, pull back... Uh, presenter function to my screen here okay, well, thank you all. because what I've done I've brought up actually your library's website 
<laughs> here. Um, for what you're asking about looking, people are asking about looking on the website. Um, I did go through here on the on the catalog here in the up top right here online catalog. Just did a search on toy library, and it did bring up. Um, oh, I don't remember how many records. There we go. So these are the things that would be some of the ones that you guys have. Yep. Yep. So yeah, you I'll can go ahead and. Those, those story starter cubes, they are so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Operation Space, I love all these. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so if you do want to know what kind of things they have in their library, we'll also include a link to their library website um, in our links, which as you see is just BlairPublicLibrary.com. Um, but yeah, you can search on the generic toy library and see what kind of things they've put into their collection to get you started, yeah. Okay, and, doesn't, and those okay. items, all of those have been evaluated again by both the child development and early ed programs and uh, the Blair Community School uh, counselors and teachers. So they were, I, I feel, a very good selection they, they put out. And if anybody is interested, you can email me. It's groberts at ci.blair.ne.us. I can send you that list uh, in an Excel spreadsheet. Oh, that would probably be very useful to some people. Yeah, definitely. Because it is a nice list, and it really gives you an idea of what to look for. Yeah. Um, oh, it, I want to know it, which it, library. You, your library is one that had the cookie cutters, correct? Yeah. Yep, yeah, it was if Blair. You, if you pop into one of those, um, sure. I, if you click into one, you'll see the um, little comments. These are what mm -hmm. we put with every one, you know, the description, the board game spinner, how many pieces, players trek their way across the rows of an Egyptian pyramid by drawing addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division cards. We put the age recommendation, nice. and then we chose our own subject headings so mm -hmm. that we could always search by that standard list right. of things to, to look for. Yeah, and they see you add that toy library as your own subject heading Those for all of these, yeah. But you had you did the cookie cutters as well, so they would be in, under something. I mean, what, you just I guess search cookie cutters. Um, the easiest or? way to look those up would be to look up by call number. Ah, okay. And if you go CC, I need to evaluate that a little bit more because we were entering them quickly. But CC is the starting of the call numbers. Showing up. I, don't see I, I did call, no, number, call but, number. Yeah. That's doing a subject. There it right. goes. Okay. Which I do need to go back in and under the subject put cookie cutters and that will make it easier. Mm. And we did a real simple catalog for it. Basically the item, the size of the item, and that's basically what we did for to make yeah. it easy for our system. Right, and for people to know what they're getting. Cool. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? I saw their emails were there on the... Um, um, oh, when people do check out the cookie cutters, do you um, they check out more than one and you ha like put them in a bag for them, or how do you actually circulate they're those? Already in bags. They're already they're, in bags. They're each in their own individual yeah. one. Uh huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they're barcoded on the bag itself. Okay. Um, and I'm, do they have a limit? We do a six six item limit. Isn't that nice okay. if the director doesn't know that? Do we have a limit? <laughs> <laughs> Probably good for me to know that. <laughs> so, okay. I, you know, I, I just really think that public libraries are meant to be the community. I mean, they're part. Of, they're an integral part of that community. And the more you can serve your community and do things for them, the more they're going to come in and, and be there for you. So, absolutely. We've experienced a lot of growth since we kind of got ourselves out of the box. Exactly. So. Mm. Uh, here's an interesting question. Um, how do you mark the cookie cutters so you know that they belong to the li to your library or the toys as well? Uh, label, sticker, something? Just trust no. them to know that they go back to you? <laughs> like books would have, you know, the stamp for the library well, on, name on them. Yeah, 
the, I mean, it's pretty obvious with the toys. Um, you know, the bag itself has our labels on it, and the the browser window has our, our call number and all that stuff on it. Then the bags are labeled with their numbers and such. Um, if they don't bring it back, they get charged for it, so there's no purpose in them trying to trade it out. I had one lady, a board broke, and she did buy a new one at Amazon, but she brought it to me and said, I brought you a new one. Can I have the old broken one? And I was like, of course. You know, sure. Sure. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah. But she was, mm -hmm. and I'll, honestly, I think their family checked it out every week, so it was, you know, they apparently loved that game. Wow. It was a math yeah. game, and it was so much fun. Yeah. And um, so... And the cookie cutters, you know, again, the bags are all labeled. With the bags the are labeled with the barcode. We didn't really label the cookie cutter because they need to be washed anyway. Yeah, that and wouldn't really be a good way to probably do that, yeah. I And we haven't put in, to be very honest, we didn't put in any, you know, $10 cookie cutters or anything. We've put in uh, the Walmart cookie cutters, 800 for $15 or whatever it was, and um, to see how it was going to go. So, you know, if we decide to put in a lot more expensive stuff, we'll probably look at some way to mark them. But these I'm not too concerned about. Right. Okay. 20, 25 cents a cookie cutter, I think we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> and like we've heard earlier, people are pretty good about, uh, you know, replacing them anyways, so mm -hmm. anything. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? We're getting almost up to 11 o'clock, top of the hour here. See, I knew we could talk that way. <laughs> well, it's one of those very interesting um, topics. You, know, you hear about libraries doing this, and some people, like here in Nebraska, I, I bear, apparently must be a common thing, cake pans. Everyone seems to know, oh, yeah, of course, cake pans. And then I see someone who I know who's a librarian up in Illinois saying, I've never heard of this. Does anybody know of places that do these cake pans and they check them out? Yeah, I exactly. said, oh, are you kidding? Every, it's, it's a huge, yeah, so exactly. it's interesting. that, And exactly. then in some other areas, they may be checking out things that you don't have a clue because nobody ever thought about it. Well, and, and when I went to the, a um, couple years ago, I went to the ASLC conference, and I was talking about the toy library, and they were just all like, wow. You know, so here are people all across the nation had not done this. And that's why, I, again, I, I, that literature review really helps, because you get a really good idea of who and who isn't. A lot of toy libraries, there were some up in Canada and stuff, and a lot of them have oh. closed them because it took too much staff time to clean hmm. and and take care of it, and their their budgets were cut. Yeah. So their staff time had to be allocated to other chores. Um, we are very lucky in that we have a huge volunteer base. We've really got a good good core of volunteers that come in. If in our friends group, if we needed somebody, you know, because like, we like to do a we clean them as they come, but we also like to do monthly good cleans and, you know, just to make sure. I, I promised the doctors in the community we would make sure things were clean. And, <laughs> and so we, uh -huh. we do still do that. And, and um, so our volunteers are integral in that. Yeah, reach out to people who will volunteer and help you out. That's Absolutely. definitely, you Absolutely. never know who might be out there wanting to do something for the library. Well, and, and maybe they'll love you so much they'll write you a check. You never <laughs> Absolutely. <know. laughs> Just don't know. Okay, doesn't look like anything new has come in while we were talking. Um, as your the emails for both of you were up on the um, last slide, so when the recording goes up, that'll be there as well. So everyone will can contact you guys if you want to, or of course go to Blair's uh, website here to find out more about what they're doing. Um, I think that's it. If we don't have any more questions, right, and if well, you guys anything else, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, let's see. I'm just looking over. Okay. Yes, thanks so much, Gail and Wendy, for uh, agreeing to speak with us today. It was very interesting, <laughs> and hopefully, some looks like some people had a lot of questions about it. And might be doing some more of these things at their own libraries, <laughs> either starting something new or a uh, new collection well, or starting for the first you time. You know, anybody who does, you know, let your systems know so it goes in their newsletter. Yeah, and let us know because it. that's how we find out, and we think, oh, maybe that's a great idea, and, mm -hmm. and we should copy you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much for everyone for attending. Um,
next week uh, we have uh, we will join us next Wednesday where our session will be on access in courts through e-government. Um, we have some people from the state uh, Nebraska State Court Administrator's Office to show you how the different web resources are available out there for um, electronic government. So hopefully you will join that. Join us for that. Otherwise, um, thank you very much for attending, and we will see you next week. Thanks. Bye bye. <laughs>